Good evening. Good evening and thank you for your patience. We are now ready to get started. Good evening and welcome, Cal State San Marcos students, faculty and staff, and community members. My name is Dr. Grace McField and I'm a professor of multilingual and multicultural education in the School of Education here at CSU San Marcos. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I wanted to share a quick story with the many students here in attendance in both venues of the event. In freshman year in college, I wrote a paper on bilingual education for an intro to sociology class. I could not have known at that time how that one paper would have led me here to stand before you as a professor of language and education. You never know what a paper, a performance, or a lecture uh, how eventually it may positively impact the rest of your life. Students, I hope you enjoy the very many interesting and lively events planned for the Arts and Lecture Series this year, which is all in this little brochure <laughs> at the back table over there. And now it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you Dr. Stephen David Krashen. Dr. Krashen is a linguist, educational researcher, advocate, and activist. He is an expert in the areas of second language acquisition, bilingual education, and reading among several education domains. He is easily one of the most influential persons in the field of education today at state, national, and international levels. His name is synonymous with key concepts and terms in these fields, such as the acquisition learning hypothesis, the input hypothesis, and free voluntary reading. Dr. Stephen Krashen completed his PhD in linguistics at UCLA and is Professor Emeritus at the University of Southern California. He's the author of more than 475 articles and books in the fields of second language acquisition, bilingual education, and literacy. Quick highlights of works by Dr. Krashen include The Natural Approach with Tracy Terrell, Foreign Language Education, The Easy Way, Heritage Language Development, and Every Person a Reader. Dr. Krashen's publications have received numerous awards, including the Mildenberger Award, given for his book, Second Language Acquisition and Second Language Learning, and the Pimsleur Award, given by the American Council of Foreign Language Teachers for the best published article. He has written over 1,000 letters to editors and newspapers, and probably holds the world record in this category. <laughs> Dr. Krashen also holds a black belt in Taekwondo, and was the winner of the 1978 Venice Beach Open Incline Press Championship. <laughs> he also spent two years in Ethiopia teaching English and science with the Peace Corps. When he is not globetrotting for invited talks and events, or tweeting or blogging about the latest education and policy developments, you can find him working out at Gold's Gym or enjoying a Pete's coffee while outlining another letter to the editor or article. <laughs> Dr. Krashen's lecture this evening will address topics currently receiving national attention, including a proposed multilingual education policy for the state of California that is awaiting the governor's signature to be placed on the November 2016 ballot, and the new Common Core Standards, which is the current um, context for K-12 through education sector. With regards to both of these topics, he will discuss the foundations and approaches that are necessary prerequisites to achieving the goal of optimal language acquisition and learning, as well as practical applications to the educational setting. So before we begin, I would like to note that, as with all campus events, the Arts and Lectures event always encourage multiple perspectives on all issues. We recognize that there are multiple perspectives to all issues, and we encourage each of you to carefully weigh the evidence and to arrive at individual opinions about any topic. Following the lecture, we will have a question and answer session. You may want to jot down questions and save them for that part of the event. And now, without further ado, Dr. Stephen Krashen. Someday I'd like some further ado, just to see what it looks like. Uh, let me comment on the introduction to give you some more information. Um, the Taekwondo black belt is true, but I have to confess that I got the black belt on the basis of the written examination. <laughs> the weightlifting thing is also true, 
I beat a former national champion. He was drunk. <laughs> I told him it was a privilege to compete against him. He says, yeah, whatever. Anyway, uh, let me begin by talking not about the issues that we just did, but something else, and that does not pertain to your students now, if you're teaching in schools, or to most of you in the audience. It will be of interest to your students in about 60, 70 years. It'll be of interest to you in 40, 50 years. It's of interest to me right now. It's about getting old. And there's one problem about getting old. Actually, I've been very interested in age the last few years. I'll tell you what happened. I was on this train going from the airport in Philadelphia into the city. There's not a bus, there's a train, a shuttle. $13, except senior citizens, $1. Must show ID. So I had my ID with me. I had one hand, I had my driver's license, one hand, the dollar. The conductor comes through, this punk. And I had my dollar ready, and I gave him the dollar. I was going to show my driver's license. He says, oh, that's okay. <laughs> they should be told, no matter how old the person looks, demand that, here you are, Sonny, you know. Well, I'll tell you what made up for this. Um, the person who saved me, believe it or not, was my favorite Hollywood person, Adam Sandler. I will tell you the story. I was in the gym in Malibu. I, was, I wasn't working out. My daughter was pumping iron. And our, her youngest child, my granddaughter, Sydney Amelia, was just born. She was about seven, eight months old. And I was holding the baby while my daughter was pumping iron. We were the only ones there until Adam Sandler walked in. I knew it was him, OK? He came up to me and said the absolute best thing you can say to someone my age. He said, oh, is this your child? <laughs> yes. So I said, no, it's my granddaughter. He comes over, gives me the, the, the equivalent of the hug among my little punches. Good looking grandpa. He could do no wrong as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> According to Maimonides, this is the highest form of charity when no one else is around to see it. He was just fantastic. Anyway, the thing about aging I'm most concerned with is dementia, senility. Bill Cosby says, don't worry about senility. When it comes, you won't know. <laughs> but I am concerned about it. I want to keep my work going. It, it is rampant in my family. It's rampant in my father's side and the Krashen side. My dad got it, all his brothers and sisters, my aunts and uncles got it, and they all got it at age 75. And I'm getting very close. So my way of dealing with my problems is to read all the research and write a paper, which is what I did. And I wrote a paper about senility and delaying senility. Uh, you can find it on my website, which is sdcrashen.com. D is for David, my middle name, right, David? OK, yes, exactly, OK. Um, and it's about keeping your brain young. I found three factors reading the literature. And it's a good introduction to the talk. Number one, reading. Reading for pleasure. Not doing dibbles or question and answer stuff, <laughs> but real reading where you're involved in the text. People my age who read a lot have the same verbal memory as people in their 30s who don't read a lot. Not bad. Number two, bilingualism. You knew that. Because you've read Ellen Bialystok's research from uh, Toronto, York University. She's been interviewed in the New York Times, very nice interview. What happens with uh, bilingualism is this. As you get older, you decline in what's called executive control. Executive control means getting distracted. Like, you know, you go downstairs to get the newspaper, and on the way there's something in the kitchen, you put that away. Then there's something else on the floor, you do something with that, the phone rings. Then you forget why you came downstairs in the first place. Okay, this happens to everybody. As you get older, it really gets bad. But if you're bilingual, the decline is a lot slower. Isn't that wonderful? So people who switch languages a lot, better executive control. The third factor, coffee. <laughs> yes, coffee. Carol, are you listening? Okay, we've got to talk now, okay? The research is actually quite consistent on this. Three cups of freshly brewed coffee a day significantly delay the onset of dementia. 
from different laboratories. They've come to the same conclusion, and there's some speculation, conjecture, based on studies with mice, that five cups a day might reverse Alzheimer's. I know you can do this. It takes discipline. <laughs> Three cups a day. Go. I'm counting on you, okay? Oh my, is there some chemicals released by cough? The good thing about the three things I just told you is that you can do all three at once. Sit down as you're doing, have a nice cup of coffee, read a book in another language, The Fountain of Youth. <laughs> if anyone here is interested in doing research on this, I volunteer my services as subject so I can get free latte. Now, a former student of mine, uh, Kyung Suk Cho, who lives in Busan in Korea, the whole time I've known her, she's just been full of ideas. We have conferences and she just comes up, and she still does it, a list of 20 great ideas. Here's one of her great ideas. She said, why don't you write to Starbucks? And her idea was, you know, Starbucks has these little messages on the cup, like, you know, be good to nature and resist evil and all these things. Uh, so I, I, I did. I wrote them, and I thought maybe if they like the coffee stuff, which will help sell coffee, they, maybe we could they put in a good word for literacy and bilingualism, and we can score a few points for our team. So I wrote to Starbucks. I said, I got this paper. You want to see it? And they wrote me back and said, we are not interested in new economic ventures at this time. <laughs> a buddy of mine, Ashley Hastings, says, this is a good example of corporate dementia. They had no <laughs> idea. Anyway, I wrote them back, and I said, no, no, no money. The paper is public domain. I'll just send it to you. You can do with it what you like. Permission granted. I never heard from them again. Anyway, so that's it. Three things. Bilingualism. Read a lot. Drink coffee. Okay? Amen. Yeah. Okay, that's today's presentation. Thank you very much. That's pretty... Actually, that's usually the only thing people remember from my talks. Anyway, um, I'd like to introduce uh, today's topic by covering what might be some old ground, but in a slightly different way, because I'm going to give you some new stuff today. Uh, the last, I'm going to summarize the last oh, 35 years of my life by saying that we have been involved in a major war in language acquisition and literacy development. And it's a good war because whoever wins, we're learning a lot from it as the research goes on defending one side the other. There are two uh, characters in the war, and they're on the handout. One is called the comprehension hypothesis. The other is called the skill building hypothesis. The comprehension hypothesis says, as most of you may have seen before, is we acquire language and develop literacy in only one way, and that's when we understand what people tell us and we understand what we read. When we do that, all the grammatical structures, all the vocabulary, spelling, composition style, writing style, all that is subconsciously absorbed. So to summarize this, first you get what we call comprehensible input. You read books, you have interesting conversations, you hear stories, which is a pleasant thing. It's got to be pleasant, it's got to be interesting, otherwise you wouldn't pay attention. The outcome are the skills. That means vocabulary, grammar, etc. The skill building hypothesis says exactly the opposite. Remember your high school foreign language class. You begin with the skills. You begin with learning rules of grammar. You begin with memorizing lists of vocabulary. Then you use your new vocabulary, your new grammar in sentences. You write them out or you say things. You get your errors corrected. And the idea is that if you do that over and over again, gradually, You'll get better, it'll become automatic, and you can use the language. It is conscious knowledge at first, which becomes more automatic with time. In other words, the skill building hypothesis is a delayed gratification hypothesis. The ability to use the language actually never comes. It's not delayed gratification, it's no gratification. Just to give you an idea what this means, delayed gratification, I've been um, profiting by the insight of Stephen Wright, the American comedian, who says that hard work and diligence pay off someday. 
but laziness and sloth you can enjoy right now. <laughs> Be in the moment, okay? So it turns out that with comprehensible input, not only is it pleasant, but it works. It actually is the only way anyone has ever acquired language. The skill building hypothesis is painful. And there is not a single person on this planet who has ever acquired language this way. The method comparison studies we've done over the last 35 years, when we compare the two in methodology, comprehensible input has never lost, not once. Skill building has never won, not, won, not once. We've looked at beginning language teaching, where comprehensible, comprehensible input is compared to traditional methods. When the test is communicative, comprehensible input always wins. When the test is grammar, it's either the same or the comprehensible input people are slightly better. Intermediate language teaching, which we call sheltered subject matter teaching, uh, content-based, when we do that, the comprehensible input methods always win. And when we look at research on reading, which has been my obsession since the middle 1980s, since I discovered the work of Frank Smith, which is quite exciting, that people who read for pleasure always do better than people who don't have larger vocabulary, larger grammar. In fact, the best research on this comes from what's called sustained silent reading studies. How many of you have heard of sustained silent reading, SSR? Some of us remember when it was called USSR. Did you know that? <laughs> uh, uninterrupted sustained silent reading. That's where you take a few minutes out of the school day, the children read what they want to read, and the teacher gets to read what the teacher wants to read. Ten minute break, okay? Very nice. In fact, I have calculated, you got to pay attention now, this is big. If you do sustained silent reading once a day, with your students, and they read what they want to read, and you get to read what you want to read. Once a day, 10 minutes over a normal teaching career, this totals up to three months paid vacation. <laughs> OK? And it works. We can take it just a little easier. This is not always the case, working harder, do more, um, et cetera. So the studies consistently show sustained silent reading to be effective. The kids in the classes do better than those who don't have it in their classes. So this is the, we now are up to the present in the research, up to the last couple of years. And what I'd like to do is push this a little bit farther. What I've said here is that comprehensible input needs to be interesting. If it's not interesting, no one's going to pay attention. In the last couple of years, I have reached another hypothesis. By the way, I'll be presenting a number of new hypotheses. In case any of you are interested in having a career like mine and be a big shot and go around and give talks and people, you know, take notes when you speak and all that, there is a secret. Invent new hypotheses and new terminology. And then everyone thinks it's your idea, okay, even though you just put a label on it. Make sure it's not completely comprehensible. <laughs> that it's a little bit vague. They don't quite understand it. Then people think you're a lot smarter than they are, okay? So I've got several new ones today. I'll try to be clear for a change. We now think that input shouldn't be merely interesting. It should be so interesting that you're completely absorbed. Very similar to what a guy named Chin Sank Mahali calls flow, where only you and the input count. In fact, you're not even aware that it's in another language. You are lost in the book, lost in the movie. That happened to you last night, which is why half of you look so sleepy, because you started reading before you went to bed, right? I was reading the novelization of Terminator 3, so of course I couldn't sleep, it was so exciting. <laughs> Okay, this is what we think really counts. I don't know if it's necessary for acquisition, but it is optimal. I'll tell you the case that got me thinking about it. This is a case from a former student of mine. Dr. McField knows her. her name is Christy Lau. Christy Lau um, lives in the Bay Area, and she has a program over the summer 
in Mandarin, Mandarin literacy. And it's designed for two groups of students, the children of immigrants who come from Mandarin-speaking areas, who are losing their Mandarin, who are becoming English dominant, contrary to what the public thinks, heritage languages start leaving right away, and also for children who've been in Mandarin immersion programs. She set up the program really well, in my opinion. Lots of books and stories and graphic novels and activities and games and read aloud and sustained silent reading. But there was one student who didn't care. You, you get these cases. His name was Jack, and Jack, for some reason, eight years old, wanted to be skateboarding instead and hanging out. So you can't play as a kid. So, all right, she said, fine, Jack, you can drop the program, but before you go, let's have a talk. They had a very brief talk. She gave him a book to look at, a graphic novel in Mandarin, in Chinese. The stories of Afanti, very popular in the whole Chinese-speaking world. Jack took it and looked at it and thought it was pretty interesting. And he started to read it. It's a little bit challenging. He asked his mom to help him. Mom read him the first book. He wanted another one. Christie supplied more, and another one, and another one. Finally, he was demanding three, four stories a day. So mom and Jack made a deal. She would read him the stories while he did the dishes, which he thought was a great idea. As long as he heard those stories, his Mandarin started to improve. At no time, this is my major point today, at no time was Jack interested in Mandarin. He was profoundly neutral toward Mandarin. It was the story. Jack taught me something, and I hope is teaching the field, something that most people in language education, it's never occurred to them. Most people don't care about language. Most people don't care about acquiring another language. Most people don't care about being bilingual or trilingual. Most people want to get through the day and have a good time. We think, oh, yeah, the idea of encouraging your kids to study hard so they can be bilingual is entirely nonsense. Today, I hereby announce the end of motivation in language. You should study English because eight and nine-year-old kids, that's not going to go very far. You tell them a story. They get involved in the story. Language acquisition is the byproduct. The result. I've got some more cases. I shouldn't tell you who this person really is, but I will, because I know you won't tell anybody. This is Christie's son. We've been calling him Paul, but his name is Vincent. Yeah, we changed it. I, I know him pretty well. I know Christie's kids. They're teenage kids. They're, they're really nice guys. I've spent a little time with them. I like them. Uh, the family speaks Cantonese. Grandma and Grandpa and Christy and her husband are native speakers of Cantonese. Christy's also fully bilingual in Mandarin, quite impressive. The boys grew up bilingual Cantonese English. Neither of them care about being Chinese. They're not ashamed of it. They're not proud of it. It's just a fact of life. They're not interested in connecting with the rest of the Chinese-speaking world. It's okay. That's all. Well, when... Uh, Vincent was young because Christy and her husband were working real hard. They had occasionally bring in help, so they had a babysitter, caretaker, and she would come in and turn on the TV Mandarin cartoons. Now, let me tell you, Mandarin and Cantonese are not the same language. They're not dialects of the same language. They're different languages. Uh, there is some shared vocabulary which helps you, but if you're a native speaker of Cantonese, that does not automatically make Mandarin comprehensible. Just like if you speak Spanish, you do not automatically understand French. There are loan words, it's helpful, but it's not the whole thing. But with the few words he knew, thanks to Cantonese, and the pictures in the cartoons, and seeing them again and again, and a helpful, very nice caretaker, he was after a while understanding a good percentage of the cartoons. After the cartoons, he started watching kids' shows in Mandarin. Then Dad would start bringing home movies for Vincent and his brother. They would always watch movies over the weekend. Now, Vincent and his brother were very close to Grandma and Grandpa, so they all got together and watched the news in the evening in Mandarin. Christy and I totaled up the number of hours of Mandarin that Vincent got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds over the years. Today... Vincent speaks Mandarin. He has a slight accent, Cantonese accent. 
People come over, though, who are Mandarin speakers. They socialize. He has no trouble at all. They've gone to China. They've gone to Taiwan. He has absolutely no trouble. Again, Vincent doesn't care about speaking Mandarin one way or the other. He liked the stories. Getting Mandarin was a byproduct of wanting to follow these wonderful films, uh, adventure series, etc. You know, Chinese TV has this wonderful history of great novels and things and swordsmen and stuff on television. So that's what he did. I got another case for you, and I'm going to refer you to the handout because these quotes are so delicious. Look about one third down the page. Free voluntary reading, reading for pleasure, is compelling comprehensible input. That's it. That's what it is. That's why it works. A wonderful article published in the Journal of Adolescent and Adult Psychology by a New York professor named Rosalie Fink. This is one of the best articles ever published. She looked at 12 grown-ups who, as children, were considered to be dyslexic, very late in learning to read. 11 out of 12 learned to read between ages 10 and 12. One didn't learn to read till 12th grade. They all grew up to be highly literate. Nine out of 12 had published papers. One was a Nobel laureate. What did they have in common? As children, each had a passionate personal interest, a burning desire to know more about a discipline that required reading. All read voraciously, seeking and reading everything they could get their hands on about a single intriguing topic. That was it. I have lots more cases. I'm going to give you one case history in some detail. It's the case history I know the best, and it will allow me to introduce another hypothesis, of course. I don't have, I don't have a good name for this one. I'm working on it. I'm going to maintain that our development of the highest levels of language, what we sometimes call academic language, you know, the focus is getting kids into academic language and kindergarten and all this, um, goes through three stages. Stage one, stories, read alouds, hearing stories told to you. Stage two, free voluntary reading. Lots of it over many years. Highly motivated reading. The third stage, again, I'm uncomfortable with this term, academic reading. It's really specialized reading because it does, academic to me means everybody's going to be a university professor. No, it's specialized reading. It could be reading in, for being an electrician or a carpenter. The bridge is free voluntary reading. I'll call this the bridge hypothesis. My claim is that free voluntary reading, reading for pleasure, will not give you all of academic language, but it, reach, it brings you to the threshold, to the point where academic texts are more comprehensible. I predict that every person in this room has gone through these stages. Some of you have done it in two languages. I'm going to tell you what happened to me. My case is clear. I know all the details. But I invite you to think of yourselves as I'm going through this. I grew up in an upper-middle-class environment. I don't have a compelling story of suffering. I'm sorry what I had to <laughs> overcome. I had it pretty easy, let me tell you. I grew up in an upper middle class family with practically zero family pathology. Can you believe that? I'm not one of those people who was born on third base and thinks he hit a triple. No, I know I was born on second base, but I was born there. Okay, of course. Um, mom and dad were, dad was very successful, ethical capitalist. Mom was wonderful. Everybody was friendly. My older sister, I will never understand her. My older sister has always been so nice to me. She's still nice to me, and I don't know why, because I never do anything for her. And she's always watching out, are you okay, you know, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so I, I heard stories from mom and dad. I heard stories in school. My older sister read me stories. We had stories everywhere. Everything that Jim Trelease would ever ask for, I had in my life, stories everywhere. The stories gave me the competence and interest to be a reader. My stage here, my free voluntary reading stage, was three substages. Number one, comic books. 
oh my gosh, comic books, <laughs> Batman, Superman, in those days it was Captain Marvel, okay? That was it. Now, I grew up not with all the advantages and only in this one way because this was before the Marvel Universe. This was before Stan Lee, who changed absolutely everything. In 1961, I doubted all this in the 40s and 50s, 1961, Stan Lee came out with Spider-Man. The most imp one of the most important characters in world literature, in my opinion. A superhero with problems. But I did okay, you know? And I try to keep up with these things. Um, I do a lot of long distance flying, so I've seen Iron Man 1, Iron Man 2, Iron Man 3. You know, I've seen uh, Thor 1, Thor 2. And if you see all these things, they allow you to see the Avengers, which is very nice. Oh, I gotta tell you this, there's one thing you've forgotten, all the honors. I am considered today to be the number one researcher in the world in the area of comic books because I am the only researcher in the world <laughs> in the area of comic books and I have won the biggest prize possible for anyone doing research in comics. I had lunch with Stan Lee. He paid. Stan Lee took me to lunch. <laughs> wow. Can I tell you about it? Yeah, okay. How many of you know who Stan Lee is? The rest of you, get on Google. <laughs> oh, I just love when he gets cameos in the movies. It's so cool. I was at USC at the time in the linguistics department and listening to a lecture on relative clauses or something. And next door, I knew Stan Lee was there talking to the comic book club. So I snuck out. I said, I've got this appointment now. And there I go there. There's Stan Lee talking to my people, the nerds. Okay. <laughs> Giving this brilliant, brilliant, brilliant uh, question and answer session. So I raised my hand, of course. And I said, uh, when is Peter Parker going to back to graduate school? I said, good idea. Yeah, wouldn't that be a message? Let's talk. So we talked. He invited me to lunch. I came with this big pile of notes on what grad school was like. It made it into the comic book one half of one issue. And, it, and he used my information, what it's like being a TA, all this stuff. And it made it into the newspaper. And the professor looked like me. <laughs> yes, this is my, my, big, my big thing. Um, also, I should tell you that Stan Lee's favorite character, the Silver Surfer the most tormented character in the Marvel Universe. Good call. The entire lunch was all about comic books and all about Peter Parker in college and stories about comics. Nothing about deals, movies, contracts. He doesn't work like that. It was all about comics. It was fantastic. I think Stan Lee and R.L. Stein have done more for literacy than anyone else on the planet. These people are amazing. Well, after comics, uh, my second stage was sports stories, basically baseball stories. My favorite author was a novelist named John R. Tunis, who wrote all these stories about a mythical Brooklyn Dodgers team. You know, he changed the name of the character. Dodgers moved, didn't they? Okay, uh, this team. <laughs> and uh, it was sequential. They would go in order, and I read all of them. The last one, just to tell you how compelling this stuff was, the last one was called World Series. The last chapter, it's the World Series. Each team has won three games, so this is the big one. It's the last of the ninth. The score is four to two, two outs, bases loaded. Can you imagine? The pitcher is the father. The batter is the son, and they haven't spoken for 15 years. <laughs> That's good writing, let me tell you. <laughs> You'll have to read it yourself to find out what happened. Um, after all that sports reading, it was science fiction, and that was a golden age of science fiction when I was in high school. Oh my gosh, uh, Robert Heinlein, Arthur C. Clarke, Isaac Asimov. Oh, it was wonderful, wonderful. Notice that all my reading was self-selected, compelling, and narrow. I didn't try to read a vast survey of the field. In high school, this was my curriculum. I read books in high school for classes. I took tests on them. I don't remember a thing about them. These books, I remember everything. 
reminds me of Alfie Cohn, one of my heroes, who says when he was in high school, he said, I paid attention to everything except the teachers. <laughs> pretty much my experience. Um, college was pretty much the same as high school. I spend most of the time drinking beer, shooting pool, uh, pumping iron, and doing stuff like that. I thought that was a pretty balanced curriculum. Uh, <laughs> Because I didn't know what I wanted. I changed my major like every four hours, you know, trying to figure out what I'm doing. <laughs> Graduate school is where I found it. And here's the bridge to academic reading. I found linguistics. That's what I wanted. I went to graduate school at UCLA. First course in intermediate linguistics was on syntactic theory. We had to read aspects of the theory of syntax by Noam Chomsky. I tried to read it. I understood zero. It could have been written in Bulgarian, for all I care. I, mean, I understood nothing. So I did something interesting, I think really helped me. And again, my point is self-selected, compelling, and narrow. I decided to read the complete works of Chomsky. I could understand his early work because there was no background assumed. His first monograph, Syntactic Structures, was clear as a bell. And because of all the reading I had done in high school, it was comprehensible. That's, I was prepared for this. I read syntactic structures, I read his next paper, I read his next paper, I read his next paper. Finally, after about a month, I had worked my way up to aspects of the theory of syntax. It was completely transparent. And to do linguistics, you had to know Chomsky. If you knew Chomsky, you knew linguistics. He was the central character and still is in syntactic theory. I read his articles with the same interest that I read the baseball stories. For me, this was compelling, probably for 0.0001% of the human race, <laughs> yes, but that was right for me. Now, I didn't read it to get writing style, but that was the result. I don't know Noam Chomsky. We're not pals. We don't hang out. Sometimes our names are linked in the same paragraph and all that, but you know, I don't know him. You know, I don't go to Boston, call him up. No, I'm Steve. Let's hang out. You know, let's go bowling. No. Um, I met him once. I shook hands. I said, I'm Steve Crash. And he said, who? That was it. But Chomsky was my teacher. I read it because I was fascinated by the topic. The result was I got scientific style. I didn't know it at the time. And I learned how to think like a scientist. Narrow, completely compelling, self-selected. My thesis was those days, the hot thing was left-right brain differences. Of course, that's what I did. This was late 60s, early 70s. We used a technique called dichotic listening. In dichotic listening, you put on headsets, and each ear hears a different stimulus and competing, and the one that responds that is more accurate tells you what side of the brain is working. I found out, just like Chomsky, there was one person who basically was the central player in this field. The person who developed the technique and had done the basic research was a Canadian professor named Doreen Kimura from Western Ontario University. I don't know Doreen Kimura. I'm sure she's never heard of me. She was my teacher. I read everything she did, starting with her first paper. I read all her papers in order and the papers of her, her colleagues that she interacted with and argued with, and I kept strict chronological order. You know, papers in experimental psychology are not like reading papers in educational theory. You can read 20 in a day and no problem because they're like three pages long. You know, this is what we did, this is how we did it, etc. By the time I did that, I knew what we were doing in our research. I knew what the next step was. I knew how to set up a dichotic listening study and I was fascinated by her work. It was again like reading a novel and I realized years later I had acquired the style of writing up academic research papers, experiments. And I had learned how to apply statistics because I had seen it done three, four hundred times in all these short papers. She was my teacher. In all cases, my big point is that acquisition of language is a byproduct. You don't try to do it. It comes as a result of being very, very interested in a topic. What happened to me was identical to what happened to the dyslexics uh, that uh, Rosalie Fink wrote about. Well, this is the theory. Now we can do some application. We can talk about the two hot issues now, bilingual education 
and the Common Core Standards will do bilingual education. Uh, there were traditional arguments for bilingual education that came out when we were in the bilingual wars in the 1990s, uh, 227 in California, and similar things passed in two other states. And it was at that time our theory, ironically, was clarified. The argument we used to support bilingual education was firmly based on comprehensible input. Here's the idea. If you give someone good education in the first language, you give the person knowledge. That's number one. Knowledge of the world, subject matter knowledge. The knowledge you get in your first language makes this input in the second language more comprehensible. It's background knowledge. So the uh, example I used over and over again in the 90s was this. We have two children going into the fourth grade. They're both limited in English. They're both English learners, as we say these days. Child number one has had a really good background in her first language. She's had math in her first language. She understands third grade math really well, okay? Child number two doesn't know her math. They both go into the fourth grade where math is taught only in English. Who's gonna do better? Child one or child two? Child one. Child one gets more math and also more English because it's more comprehensible. It all depends on this comprehensible input idea. That's one of the pillars of bilingual ed. The second pillar is that literacy transfers across languages, and this argument also depends heavily on the concept of bilingual ed of concept of comprehensible input. Three-step argument. Number one, this is basically, again, the comprehension hypothesis. We learn to read by reading. This is the version of the comprehension hypothesis uh, presented by uh, Kenneth Goodman and Frank Smith, which I think is absolutely right, which preceded my work, as a matter of fact. It says we learn to read by reading. We learn to read by understanding what's on the page. If you, learn, if you understand what's on the page, you gradually absorb the spelling rules, the phonics rules, et cetera, et cetera, build up vocabulary. If this is true, it's a lot easier to learn to read if you already understand the language. I'm going to publish in a new journal, sell this, publish this in a new journal called Da Her. I mean, it has to be true. Okay? Even the bitterest enemies of bilingual education, Christina myself, admits that this is true. Obviously, it has to be. So we learn to read by reading. If you already know the language, it's easier to learn to read. Once you can read, it transfers across languages, and there are mountains of papers showing this is true. We know that kids who learn to read in Spanish have an easier time in English. Kids who learn to read in French have an easier time. Uh, Chinese, Vietnamese, Japanese all transferred English. So even if the writing systems are different, Turkish to Dutch, nor, uh, Turkish to Norwegian, Arabic to French, wherever people have looked for evidence of transfer, they have found it. Once you can read, you can read. From this, we came up with three principles of bilingual education. Number one, teach subject matter in the first language. Number two, that gives you background knowledge. Number two, literacy in the first language. Number three, comprehensible input in English through good ESL, Shoutlet classes, etc. And the prediction we had then is that programs that do this teach English very well. In fact, they teach English better than all-day English programs. Now, we are at an interesting crossroads here in history because, as some of you may know, there is now an effort to reverse Proposition 227. Did you know that? to make bilingual education okay again. It's 1174 being presented to uh, the governor at this moment, uh, done by Senator Laura. At the same time, we now have the strongest evidence we've ever had, and it's time for me to embarrass Grace and David, okay? Because the McField, sitting right in front, have done the world's greatest paper ever done on bilingual education. It's right here on the bottom of your page, some of you have seen it. 
uh, Grace and David, the McField's here, did a meta-analysis of meta-analysis. Here's what they did. They looked at every study ever, ever, ever included in any of these surveys of bilingual ed. They then considered two factors. Did it agree with the underlying, with the underlying theory? Two, was the statistical analysis done right? Was the design correct? They found that programs that were consistent with the theory and where the statistical design was right had the largest impact we have ever seen for bilingual education, approximately double what we have seen before. When this came out, right at the time 1174 was coming, I, of course, started writing letters to the editor. By the way, I've broken the world's record for letters submitted, not published. Okay. Uh, and I'm saying it's over. We have the answer now. This is it. This is the most thorough analysis ever done. It should be over. Our job as citizens, and I will talk about this later, is publicizing it. Well, this is part of the argument for bilingual ed. There's a little more. I said three principles, and I've listed four. That's not a mistake. I'll pretend I did it on purpose. Continuing bilingual education. Heritage language development. Should we continue the first language after English is acquired? Yes. Our colleague Jim Crawford says this is a win-win proposition. There are no disadvantages to continuing the first language and only advantages. The politicians think otherwise. The politicians say, well, these families should stop hanging on to their home languages and they should embrace English, the language of our country, etc. Well, these are people not experienced in the real world. I, I couldn't see my therapist this week, so you have to help me out. <laughs> my therapist and my lawyer are the same person. Um, <laughs> uh, let me tell you what happened to me about three years ago, and I still haven't recovered from this. Now, Saturdays, See, I, I'm a Reconstructionist Jew, so that means Saturday afternoon. In the morning, of course, I go to synagogue and all that, but after that, I get to do what I want. So what I did on one Saturday is I brought the car in for servicing, and I do that in Santa Monica on Santa Monica Boulevard. So I brought my car in, my Rolls Royce, no, my car. And uh, I was gonna, what I do is I take the blue bus down to the promenade and hang out, you know, at Starbucks at Barnes & Noble and try to look cool, you know, and come back. Well, I got to the bus stop. And I had just missed the bus, Saturday, 40 minutes, you know, what's the name? There were two women talking. And they were in their 60s, I'd say. And they were talking in Spanish. One of them left, so I struck up a conversation with the other. We started in Spanish, but it was very evident right away that the woman spoke English much better than I speak Spanish. So she said to me, oh, you want to speak Spanish? Let's do it. I said, great, I just love languages. Let's do it. So Spanish is kind of down the list for me in languages. I'm working on it. I'm trying to get better. I'm reading Zorro in Spanish now. <laughs> Isabel Allende. Wow, is she good. Oh, my goodness, what a book. Why didn't you tell me about her before? <laughs> okay, anyway, so we got into this conversation, and she's one of these people you rarely meet who's just wonderful. She's been in the United States 20 years or so. She cleans houses. She started telling me stories what you find in the homes of the rich and famous. <laughs> I opened the closet door and I don't want to tell you what's, okay, I'll tell you, here's what happened. <laughs> and in, before the bus came, as the fluent bilinguals we were, we were code switching, but then when the bus came, she was in the middle of a hot one <laughs> and it was all in Spanish. So we're sitting there, I'm sitting here, she's my new BFF is sitting here. <laughs> and this Anglo woman is sitting perpendicular looking at us, and my friend is going on and on, yo, gosh. Finally, she got to her stop, and she got off, and we embraced. So nice meeting you. And uh, the woman's looking at me, the other woman. And I said to her in English, I said, you meet the most interesting people on the bus. And I said, well, she said, well, at least you can talk to her. I said, what do you mean? These people come here, they never learn English. Actually, she speaks English very well. She speaks English a lot better than I do Spanish. She was just being nice to me. I don't know what's wrong with them. They come to the United States and they just stay with their own people. Why don't they just stay home? I said, I told you she speaks English. She speaks English very well. I, they just, I don't, I don't understand it. There should be a law. So <laughs> I started telling her about the research. A lot of good that did. 
<laughs> I said, immigrants start acquiring the language right away. Hispanics do it at the same rate as other groups. You know, all this stuff. And she finally got off the bus, shaking her head. And, I don't know what's wrong. She's just another instance of all these Spanish speakers who don't bother to learn English. You know, this is what we get from the media, from the public all the time. In reality, it's quite different. As all of you know from your, your experience and what you've seen, that first languages start disappearing right away. The first generation is dominant in the first language. The second generation is English dominant. Their kids are very often monolingual, as we know. The problem is keeping the heritage language. It's hard to do. There are several reasons why it's hard. Number one, you don't get a lot of input. If all you get, if you say your uh, heritage language is Spanish and you only get it from mom and dad, you've got to discuss a lot of things with them on a lot of deep topics if you want to keep your language level pretty high. Another problem where the kids get to high school, this is Lucy Say's work. She calls it bicultural ambivalence. They want English. They want to fit in. Okay? So the push is not to keep the home language. There's a third element that I've written about called language shyness. Let me put it to you this way. Let's say you are the youngest child, the youngest of three, in a family that speaks another language here in the United States. And you're not just the youngest child, you're the youngest cousin. So your command of the language is going to be the weakest of anybody in the family. If it's Spanish, when you're eight, you'll speak Spanish as a six-year-old would in Mexico City. That's normal. It's going to be a slower development. What happens when you're at a family gathering and you say something in Spanish and you make a mistake? They laugh and they never let you forget it. <laughs> Do you remember what you said when you were seven? Mom, I'm 36. Give me a break. You know. So as a result, you stop using the language and you get even worse. Okay? The cure, I think the cure is reading. Lots and lots of reading. But my point is, heritage languages are good for you. Heritage languages, as we saw, delay the onset of senility. That's good. You have the benefit of the wisdom of the entire older generation and uh, family of origin, unavailable to most people. Not only that, there are occasionally economic advantages. This English push worldwide has all of us concerned. It's a two-edged sword. We're very happy that it's happening. We're very happy that, you know, Argentina can talk to Poland in English. This is a real benefit. On the other hand, we all worry about what's happening to native languages, native cultures, uh, the literature, the wisdom of the first language, um, etc. So the fourth part is keeping the heritage language. I have one more case history, and that's Arnold. Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. Here's the gossip. Arnold has claimed that he came to the United States. By the way, looking at the clock, I'll be done by, I'd say, quarter to 11. Is that OK? I've, I've ordered pizza. Remember fast times at Ridgemont High? They'll be coming. OK. No, I won't go on that long. But I've got to tell you about Arnold and a little bit about Common Core and how to change the world. Um, Arnold claimed he came as a penniless immigrant. False. He was Mr. Universe three times already. He wasn't penniless. He was employed by the Weeder Barbell Company and was given quite a bit. Uh, he claimed he never spoke German to anybody. False. I heard him. I was pumping iron on Venice Beach when he came. <laughs> by the way, in terms of Arnold gossip, as a person, Arnold was great. Really, really nice guy. You'd be doing your bench presses, as I know you all do, okay? And Arnold would come over, nobody else there. Kind of like Adam Sandler said, can I spot you? And Yeah, I'll help you. And uh, he would give us little bits of advice on the beach. I'll tell you the two bits of advice that stuck with me. When you're doing a press, don't lock out all the way, 99%. It keeps the strain off the ligaments. He says, when you're doing your exercise, keep your mind in the muscle a kind of meditation. Both of those have been very important. He would tell one person something, it would go around the beach, you know, Arnold says do this, Arnold said do that. So as a, just a guy on the beach in a gold's gym, Arnold was terrific, absolutely nice guy, no question. 
as governor. <laughs> Airline pilot needed no experience necessary, learn on the job. Okay. Um, Arnold says he gave advice to Spanish speaking immigrants. He says, don't no, stop speaking Spanish. Stop watching TV in Spanish. Do everything in English. Well, he didn't do that. He and Franco Colombo spoke German to each other all the time. He would always speak German to his mother in law, Mrs. Kennedy. She spoke German, and they loved having long conversations in German. So he did not avoid the first language. Did he speak English when he came? He said, no, yes, he could. He was a high school graduate. He had seven years of English as a foreign language. He was already Mr. Universe. He traveled English-speaking countries. The, the Mr. Universe contest in those days was in London. The big guy before Arnold was Reg Park from South Africa. Reg and Arnold became buddies. Arnold would go to South Africa for weeks and stay with Reg and with his family, all in English, interviews in English. Sure, he improved. He had ESL. The first thing he did was enroll at Santa Monica Community College. He took the entire sequence and then went on to regular English classes, ultimately got a bachelor's degree in business administration. He had de facto bilingual education. He had all these things. He had knowledge, academic knowledge, because he was a high school graduate and a very keen student and a good reader. He had literacy, because he was literate in German. He had comprehensible input in English, not just from classes. One of his buddies was Frank Zane, a junior high school teacher from Venice. And Frank helped him a lot, helped him on his work and translating things. His first girlfriend was a composition teacher from a community college. Okay? He had people helping him all the way through. This is not what the typical hardworking immigrant comes from. Some people come here in their late teens. They've had four years of schooling. They've got to work, work, work. They don't have time to go to these classes. They don't have friends that are going to help them. They don't have a high school education. Arnold had bilingual ed. He had de facto bilingual ed. The problem with bilingual education is getting the facts to the public. That is the problem. I must have written 200 letters during 227 saying the most important fact, kids in bilingual program do better in English reading than kids in English pro all English programs. We need to keep saying this, and now we have the research to back this up more strongly than it's ever been backed up before. The public needs to know about these studies, especially the most recent one. Okay, a few words about the Common Core. The Common Core, in my opinion, is a bad solution to a non-existent problem. I regard it as a tsunami. First of all, the reason for the Common Core is because our schools are failing, right? Our schools are broken. I get this magazine from USC, because I worked there once, and it's, you know, for family, Trojan family and all this. And one of the articles was really good. It was about the use of video games in education. And it was an interview with three video game experts. And the interviews were fabulous, I thought. The header to the article was, maybe this will fix our broken schools. Of course, I wrote them a letter, which they published, OK? So that's some, some gratification. Why do people think our schools are so bad? Because of test scores because we do not do well in international tests. Isn't that what you read about? You know, the Chinese are beating us, Shanghai is beating us, South Korea is beating us, all these other countries are beating us. Well, the, the big one is Shanghai, which is, by the way, not a country. Did you know that? Oh, they don't know that in the newspapers. It's a middle class area of China. And uh, Hong Kong is beating us, not a country. Did you know that? They don't, they don't know these things. Singapore is beating us. Well, kind of a country. It's really a city where the working class goes home at night to neighboring countries. So our test scores are low. They're terrible. They're terrible. Actually, they're not that bad. When you look at the raw test scores, they're a little better than average. It's not like we're down there with the you know, worst scores all the time. Not at all. What several researchers have done, Richard Rothstein has done a beautiful job of this, they have done statistical analyses where they control for the effect of poverty. When you do that, the United States is at the top of the world, among the very few countries way up there at the top. It's poverty. The reason for our low test scores is because we have such a high rate of child poverty. Until last week, I've been using this statistic, which I'm going to correct. 
according to a UNICEF study, we, are, we have the second highest rate of poverty of 34 industrialized countries. 23%, one out of four kids. Compare that to high-flying Finland, where it's around 5%. My colleague Susan Ohanian corrected me on this. I got a letter published in the Christian Science Monitor, all right, and Susan put it on her website and said, by the way, Steve, it's much higher than that. If you look at inner cities, it's way up, and she's right. The poverty rate in urban areas is a Chicago, LA, LAUSD area, 80%. That's like Haiti, okay? The problem is poverty. That is it. Poverty means many things. I'll just talk about three. Nutrition, food. Kids in high poverty do not get the amount of food or the nutritional value in good food that we get. Number two, health care. Uh, David Berliner has pointed out in his review of the research that the ratio of school nurses per child in rich schools is a lot better than in poor schools. There are more school nurses in rich schools. The rich are getting richer. Health care, to me, means the basics. It means making sure you don't have a toothache or an abscess. It means having glasses so you can see the board. We're not talking about really you know, sophisticated, rare diseases here. We're talking about ordinary hygiene and things that kids should have. The third, libraries. As our research on free voluntary reading gets stronger and stronger, libraries are disintegrating all over the country. Children of poverty have practically no access to books. They have fewer books at home. They live in neighborhoods with inferior public libraries. They don't even have bookstores anywhere close to their home. And the classroom libraries and school libraries in schools of poverty are much worse than in the middle class schools. You can have the best teaching in the world, and it won't help when kids are hungry, when they're ill, and they have nothing to read. This business that the most important variable is the teacher, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, School of Education, it isn't true. The most important things are the stuff that goes on outside of school. Given reasonable homes uh, outside of school support, yes, teaching will make a difference. It's not huge, but it is, it, it is there. This has been basically distortions of Eric Hanischek's work, who's busy doing his own work and distorting them, where what Hanischek has done is looked at paper, papers listing teachers and their scores and how they've gotten test scores. He's extrapolated what would happen if you take the best one here, the best one here, and the best one there, and then he's come up with the conclusion that in three years, with the top, top teacher, the scores will go up this much. This is extrapolation from stuff on, on paper. It has never been demonstrated. And when you have high poverty, it's not going to work at all. Again, yes, teaching important? Absolutely. Should we get better in teaching? Yes. Should we do research in teaching quality? Yes. Is this the most important variable? No. What this data shows, because of the power of poverty, is that there is nothing wrong with our schools of education. There's nothing wrong in teacher quality. There's nothing wrong. It's not the fault of teachers' unions. It's poverty, 100%. Now, the big problem with the Common Core, and I think the reason behind the Common Core, is the testing. The entire reason we have a Common Core is because this idea, which they, I'm sure they had in mind from the beginning. First of all, they're bringing in more tests than we've ever seen. Remember NCLB? No corporation left behind. Remember that? <laughs> we have increased the amount of testing about 20-fold over No Child Left Behind. Everybody says it was too much. We're going to have testing all subjects, not just two subjects. We're adding writing tests. They're developing math tests, social studies tests. They want to test P to 12, preschool to 12. That's what the documents say. I'm not making this up. This all comes from the government websites. They want to test every subject, and they want interim tests through the year. Okay? We, they were calling them formative, but now they know better. This is not formative evaluation. This is tests. Off-the-shelf commercial tests. And they're even talking about pre-test. So we can look to see how much is gained in the year without the influence of summer, which doubles it. 
My estimate, this is a 20-fold increase in testing. That's not the worst thing. I'm building suspense. Here's the worst thing. All the testing has to be online. This is genius because the companies know how infatuated we are with technology. We've all got these and the new one comes out and everybody wants the latest one. Okay, so it's got to be good for kids. Now, what does this mean if we're testing all kids online? First of all, it means every school has to be connected to the internet. We've been paying for this out of our phone bills. Did you know that? This comes from our money. This is part of US law. So there's part of your phone bill that goes to a fund to make sure all kids are connected to the internet because people assume it is a virtue. Not only that, every child has to be, have access to an up-to-date computer. Microsoft has made sure, I'm talking Bill Gates, has made sure that the old operating systems aren't going to work. We have to have up-to-date. Now, if you've got 50 million kids in school, you need a new computer how often? Once every three years. Isn't that true? That means one th oh, total it up, $1,000 for a minimum computer for one-third of 50 million kids, a lot of money. Every time someone in the computer world comes up with a new idea, we've got to change everything. This is the most outrageous form of planned obsolescence that we have ever seen. I have estimated that this is not just the millions. This is the billions. And it is a boondoggle that will never end because it's the law now. Everyone has to do it for all these tests all the time, which means whenever there's any kind of a major change, not just an upgrade, we're going to have to change everything. I keep thinking of my cousin Mel. He's a really nice guy. He's got these grandchildren, and he loves them, and he's a good guy. He wants to. So he made sure his house was computer friendly. A few years ago, he had the whole thing fixed up with Ethernet. <laughs> Two weeks later, Ethernet was out. It was Wi-Fi. Okay, and you can bet what we've got now, whenever someone in the computer companies gets a new idea, we're going to have to do it. There is no evidence that any of this will work. None. And there is no attempt to find out. I have a government document that I've been passing around that's from the technology department, Department of Education, it says we don't have time to get the best computer method to get the best way of delivering these things to kids. We have to go with what we have now and make repairs as we go because we're so far behind Shanghai. No, this means they don't care. They want it there now and we can, the gov we can pay. We, the taxpayers, will pay. The computer companies can't lose. When they put this stuff in, who pays for it? We do. It comes from our taxes without any evidence that it will work. In fact, study after study shows that when you increase testing, student performance does not increase. There's no connection. And there's no evidence for this brave new technology. All the money that's going into technology now is going into implementation, not into basic research. There is not even an attempt to see if this stuff will work. There are no small-scale studies as we're supposed to do in education. If the idea were, let's try online testing with a small group in one district and let's see how it's going and look at I would be in favor of that. But no, they're imposing this stuff that has no basis behind it on the, country, on the entire country. What's going to happen when it does not result in improvement? Who will be blamed? Teachers. teachers. It's those lazy teachers. We've done, they've done such a good job in destroying the reputation of teachers through the media, it is unbelievable. Teachers, and you know what it means we're going to have to do about it? We're going to need even more control and more tests. It'll be national testing 2.0. Okay? So they can't lose. I have one more comment to make about the Common Core, and then I'll talk about revolution. <laughs> By the way, you're all under arrest. Okay. <laughs> Um, my last comment is this. I have not discussed the standards themselves. The standards, there's a lot of talk in the media about standards, and the standards themselves are pretty awful. I mean, uh, if you've looked at them, I've looked at both the English and math standards. The English standards, Susan Ohanian says, they're, they're designed for English majors, basically. They're really abstruse and complicated. They're not going to help people who want to be carpenters and electricians and 
it, it is an elitist st uh, set of standards that's for a very small minority of kids. It was John Gardner, former cabinet member, who said, if we praise mediocre philosophy and disrespect competent plumbing, neither our theories nor our pipes will hold water. And we're doing this with the Common Core, aiming it at a small group. The math standards require advanced algebra. Algebra two, really hardcore. Way beyond what anybody needs. Something like two, three percent of the population needs any kind of math beyond algebra, basic algebra for their, for their work. And not even that, I think. That's an overestimate. There have been, been surveys. And let me tell you, I love math. I love it. I had calculus, advanced calculus, differential equations. Uh, I was in the first AP class ever taught in the United States. I think math is fantastic. I dream about, you know, the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, <laughs> and Fermat's last theorem. That should be a murder mystery. Anyway, uh, so I'm all for it, but I know that it's not for everybody. We have really gone nuts with this. Now, when people complain about the standards, here's what happens. The common core test makers concede the point. Nine out of 10 times, they make concessions. Say, so, oh, yeah, uh, I guess there are too many tests, or I guess there shouldn't be that much writing, or this, this item is bad, we'll change it, which mollifies the critics. Chomsky said the way totalitarian regimes work is you allow vigorous debate within a very limited domain. People fight hard, they get what they want, and they think everything is fine. So the common core test makers have backed off a few things. And the people writing curriculum, to me, that is a weapon of mass distraction. What they have done is deliberately made the standards too hard, hoping that we'll get very excited, argue vigorously against it, and we'll get our way. And what remains, the common core remains. And all our energy has been diffused. So my view of the common core is that there is no compromise. I would compromise if I could. But I think it is misguided from the beginning. Oh, by the way, the common sense argument for the Common Core, I should mention this, is what happens if a child from Kentucky moves to New Jersey? Will chemistry be the same? And we have to make sure, otherwise the kids will get confused. This argument was rarely expressed before the Common Core. Now everyone thinks it's a big deal. That has never been a problem. Chemistry in New Jersey and chemistry in Georgia and Florida have always been the same. They use the same textbooks. The periodic table is taught pretty much the same way throughout the world. You have trouble with your Bunsen burner no matter where you are, OK? <laughs> so this is a made-up argument because of textbooks and because of the very competent, in many cases, teacher organizations devoted to subject matter. There's been reasonable uniformity. So they've made this up as suddenly this new problem. Now let me talk about what to do about all this. Let's turn the page. And I'll suddenly start being rational. My best suggestion, I think, is if we're going to talk about these things and talk about them in public, is to stay focused. And stay focused on the big issues. Here is Henry David Thoreau. There are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. Let's make sure, let's figure out what the big issue is, and let's go after it. In my opinion, the big issue in bilingual education is, does it work? Does it help kids acquire English? We now have the data saying it does. We have to repeat this again and again. It takes a lot. And I have here some uh, letters to the newspapers. The first one tells us what we're up against. Uh, when 1174 came out, this guy, Chris Daly, published in the LA Times. I checked him out. He's an old man. He's 71. Okay. <laughs> what am I saying? OK. Uh, and he's always writing letters to the newspapers on just about anything. And he says, this is no good because you've got to know English. To be successful, you have to know English. Uh, all our instruction must be in English. You have to have the skills they need to succeed in more competitive. He thinks the argument's English. And the stupid LA Times editorial readers, editorial editors, didn't realize that that one's been settled in the research. 
we have to tell people it's been settled. The, um, and here's my response to it, where I talk about Grace and David. The common core, the argument here that I've been made in my last eight letters to the editor is a reaction to the conservative complaints about the common core. What has gotten publicity is that most people now are hesitant about the common core. They don't support it. But all this is coming from the right wing. 70% uh, of Republicans oppose the common core, something like 30% of Democrats. The Republicans oppose it for Republican reasons, the central government interfering with schools. That's the rational Republicans whom I do admire because they generally have clear principles and they follow what they say. Uh, I put Ronald Reagan in this category. I have no complaints you know, about these people. They have clear arguments and they stick to them. Then there's the crazies who <laughs> say, well, if the Common Core goes in, they're going to teach homosexuality in school, you know, and, uh, and all this amazing stuff, anti-creationism or pro-creationism, anti-evolution, none of which has anything to do with any of the issues. So the problem is that we haven't spread the information to people, to open-minded people who would understand it if it were out there. And the arguments there, it's poverty. Control for poverty, test scores are high. Let's use the money to protect children from the effects of poverty. Instead, we're throwing away this money on testing where there's no evidence for it. I have here on the bottom how to deal with this and still maintain your life. Um, this is inspired by an article written by Bertrand Russell, published in Science 1960, who talks about, he was talking about the danger of nuclear fallout. Very real threat, especially with all the testing going on. He said there are three places you can get your information. You can push your information. You can write to the media and talk to reporters, and you should do that, yes. But he says that's limited. I do it all the time, but I know it's limited. It's limited because the reporters are overworked, absolutely overworked. They often don't have time or background to understand the issues. And in a few cases, not as many as you think, they're influenced by editorial policy and financial interests. Most of the time, the newspapers are pretty good. Uh, if 20 letters come in with one point of view, one will get in, no matter what the view is, by most newspapers. I've gotten published in the Wall Street Journal several times. And that, then if you read their uh, editorial section, it's very conservative. But you know, me and Sarah Stevenson, my friend from uh, Texas, the librarian, has also gotten in. If they get lots of letters, they will put one in. So it's not hopeless, it's just hard to do. The second is, and Russell points out, you can go to politicians and do that. Well, this is a problem is politicians are also busy and they're influenced by their staff members who are giving them information that they think they want. And the staff is responsible for feeding them. So there is not huge amounts of corruption and immorality here. It's just the way things happen, in my opinion. Bertrand Russell says what we really need to do is go directly to the public. Now, we can do this. This is the responsibility of the scientist. In this case, the responsibility of the educator. We can do this because we have something that Bertrand Russell didn't have. We have the internet. The internet is our underground. I invite you to look at the internet and use it. Before I give you some possible behaviors you might consider, let me first of all say my suggestions are designed not for people like me. People like me, the old guard, I'm retired. I can't be fired. Okay? <laughs> this is, I'd say whatever I want to. The same thing with Diane Ravitch, who takes full advantage of this, who writes brilliant stuff and gives speeches all over. Same thing with my colleague Susan Ohanian. Same thing with Alfie Cohn. We speak out all the time, and no one's going to fire us because we are voluntarily unemployed. <laughs> That's not true of most people. Practicing teachers and students have to be a little careful. Number one, they don't have the amount of time that I do. I have nothing to do all day. I can do this stuff all day long. I have, don't even have to go to committee meetings. Yes. Okay. <laughs> no faculty meetings. Wow, it's great. Um, so we have more time. We can't be fired. 
we are not in danger. We don't have to worry about the huge responsibilities that most of you have all day long. Like teachers, oh my gosh, teaching has never been harder, overwhelmed with work, uh, always afraid if your name appears in the newspaper, you might get in trouble. I don't know how real that is, but it certainly is a real perception. Here's my recommendation. It doesn't take much. First of all, in terms of time, I recommend if you're interested in being part of this, you don't need to put in much time. Five minutes a day, more than enough. That's it. You don't have to get into any danger. I would say five minutes a day of reading and an occasional sharing. What should you read? Not much, because you don't have time. <laughs> get on this woman's mailing list. Now, you can follow me on Facebook. You can follow me on Twitter. I hope you'll follow me on Twitter. I'm trying to catch up to Justin Bieber. Um, <laughs> he's fallen to third place now, okay, behind uh, Katy Perry and Lady Gaga, okay? So I think he's vulnerable, all right? <laughs> At the rate I'm going, 2,805 years, I'll catch up with him. I've been taking omega-3 fatty acids, so I think I can do it. Okay. But Susan Ohanian's the big one. Get on her website. Get on her mailing list. It's all there. To me, this is the center of gravity of the resistance. She has columns, what's going on, the outrage of the day, uh, letters that have appeared, easy to read and quick. You don't have to do long studies of things. This is the one place, I think, where it all begins. So number one, read Susan O'Hanian. Number two, you see something you like, share it. Share it with a friend. Six degrees of separation. If we all share this stuff, it will spread throughout the country before you know it very quickly. Now, if you want to go to, the, by the way, Susan Ohanian's first book was called Whatever Happened to Recess? Because people were canceling recess so they could do more test prep. Former teacher, 25 years in the classroom, she knows her stuff. If you want to go, this is stage one. And this, I think, is enough. Read a little bit of Ohanian. If you like something, pass it on. That's all. And things will happen. If you want to do more, you can make some comments. The newspapers, or just like things, that's really enough. The newspapers, when you see an article in newspapers, very often they'll have a comment section afterwards. Who's commenting now? The same people. No matter what the article is, they'll say, oh, it's because of all these immigrants. Right? No matter what you mean. <laughs> or it's because of Obama you know, who wants to bring in, you know, he's an Islamic terrorist, you know, and all this stuff. It's all these crazy people out there. So I would say contribute to this. Just like something that you, someone else writes. That's all. If you don't want to use your name, you can invent a pen name. One of my favorite people, I have no idea who this person is, chem teacher, makes comments all over the place Chem teacher is brilliant. I have learned so much from chem teachers. When someone, chem teacher is a high school chemistry teacher, obviously, he or she, there's a, someone writes something, chem teacher will make a very perceptive comment based on their own experience, okay, which really, really counts. So this is the next step. If you feel like doing a little more, make a comment. You don't have to use your real name. Right now, nobody's doing that. The right wing, the opponents are very well organized. We are not. If you want to do more, then we can talk about it. But I doubt that most people in this room have time. That is my message today. I will request that you burst into wild applause, and then we can do the Q&A. How's that? OK. okay. Oh, I, I have conditions on questions. Can I state my conditions? Sure. I have conditions on questions. The first one has to be friendly. <laughs> After that, you can ask whatever you like. I was at a University of California campus once, and I said that, and three hands went down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, so we will now have a question and answer session. If you have a question, please line up on this side of the podium so that um, we can have you speak to the microphone. Um, you, do, you don't want to walk over there? Okay, all right. I, 
Walk to you. All righty. Um, I hear people talking about bilingual education a lot, and I've really come in my career to be kind of against what I think of as bilingual education, but I'm very in favor of dual immersion uh, for the reason that at the beginning of my career, I found students being segregated and put in classes with teachers like me who didn't speak Spanish very well. And I came back from Portugal. I was put in a class to teach in Spanish. And I said, I don't have any more respect for this system. This is not bilingual. This is just a good, another name for segregation. But now I'm doing a charter school program, dual immersion, and I'm, I'm all for that. But um, so have you ever had, heard that argument against bilingual oh, education? Oh, sure. Sure I have. Was that and friendly? I was trying to be friendly. Yeah, that's close enough. Um, you dare ask me that hostile question? Okay, no, that's fine. Let me first of all put in a good word for regular bilingual education. And my point is that regular bilingual education achieves faster integration than doing nothing. We have a tension between comprehensibility and integration. We want kids to get comprehensible instruction. We also want them to be together. But the answer is not submersion. Okay. Let me show you what regular bilingual education can do. An application of the three principles. Uh, we'll divide the day into mainstream, ESL sheltered, and first language, L1. Child comes in knowing no English. We immediately put the children together. As long as input is comprehensible, it's OK. We put them together right away in art, music, and physical education, high quality ESL, core topics taught in the first language, because they're not going to be comprehensible if they're taught in English. As soon as possible, and this doesn't take much time, we start moving ESL, and we do what's called sheltered subject matter teaching, where the kids are getting let's say math and science in comprehensible English, but by themselves. Because when you let native speakers in the class, it gets much too hard. They do social studies and they do language arts in the first language. There'll be some surprises, wait. We then start mainstreaming, but not all at once. We, main, so we keep this stuff. We mainstream math and science first which is easier to make comprehensible than social studies and math. So the kids have had a nice transition. They've had, say, math in the first language, sheltered math, and then they get it in the mainstream where it's comprehensible. Uh, ESL is gradually becoming sheltered language arts, social studies, sheltered language arts in the first language. Eventually, all subjects go into the, into the uh, mainstream, and we can continue our heritage program. What I'd like to do to achieve more integration, in a pro I think this isn't bad, Where but that it, would, it began in uh, Los Angeles Unified, and it's been done in you know, quite a few districts. Um, I don't know anymore who's doing stuff. What I'd like to do is start for the English-speaking kids, Spanish as a second language right away. The TAs are the native speakers of Spanish helping out just as the native speakers of English are teaching assistants for ESL. As this gets better and they start doing sheltered literature, I would like sheltered popular literature, you still are getting help from the native speakers of Spanish and vice versa. Eventually, advanced language arts, they all come together. Now, that's not as immediate as some people would like it to be, but you have to keep it comprehensible at the same time. Dual language is tough. Here's the problem with dual language. Dual language, you've got two groups of kids. Let's say, at an extreme case, one, one group only speaks English and the other group only speaks Spanish. You wind up doing this anyway because you're grouping all the time. That's the problem. So it isn't easy. And I think it winds up de facto becoming pretty similar to this kind of program that I have on the board. Uh, I've reviewed the research on dual language. It's okay. It's about as good as regular bilingual ed in terms of English, sometimes a little better. Uh, I've seen some dual programs that are really good. 
where they've been very um, innovative. My complaint on dual language, I wouldn't call it a complaint, my concern is that it's achieved cult-like status. The people assume this is the only possible way to do it. Uh, one state wanted to make it the law, the only way you could do bilingual ed, which I think is unrealistic. And I think we must consider it to be a very promising idea. That's the category I would like for it. And instead of dual language conferences being just cheerleading sections for dual language, let's use them to work out the best ways of getting the kids together maximum, at the same time keeping input comprehensible. I find it's a promising way. It's not the way, but a promising way of dealing with the problem you brought up. Not necessarily, right now we've got it all, but it needs to be worked on. It also brings, it, it brings together a community of people. And that's wonderful. That may be the most important. That may be the most important. OK. I'll go, Mas. Hi. Friendly question. What's yeah. your favorite sport? My favorite sport? And then I have another question. <laughs> Why do you ask? I don't know. Just curious. Actually, I don't do any sports. I still pump iron. Oh, I compete. I'm still competing in that stuff. Yeah, oh. I still do that. So that's my favorite sport, powerlifting. So but I do other stuff. I wouldn't call it a sport. I'd take a fighting class, you know, if you're interested. <laughs> but my favorite sport, I have a lot of problems with sports. Um, let me take advantage of your question okay. to recycle stuff that I've talked about. Um, I think our culture is quite pathological about sports. We have become spectators, not a culture. We've become an audience, all right? Uh, and people invest an enormous amount in sports, which have achieve the status of religion, like the Super Bowl. Noam Chomsky had a, wrote an article about sports, believe it or not. It was absolutely brilliant. He said that he was riding in the car listening to sports radio. I have a hard time thinking about Chomsky and sports radio. I like sports radio because my cousin, Big Ben Meller, is one of the top guys, okay? So there. Anyway, um, and he, people call in, and he's amazed at their expertise how much they know in terms of sheer information and the degree of critical thinking that people call up and exhibit when they talk about baseball or football. Like, you know, they shouldn't have done the hit and run because there was only one out and, you know, they were behind. They should have bunted and done the sacrifice. When you're in a sports argument, Chomsky points out, say, my experience too, when I'm in a sports discussion with any grown-up American male, they never say anything stupid, ever. <laughs> They say things you disagree with, but they never say stupid things, and they bring together massive amounts of information. When I was 11, growing up on the north side of Chicago, any, my, me or any of my friends could have run the Chicago Cubs for a week. No one would have known the difference, because <laughs> we knew so much about it. Chomsky says the interesting thing is that you can't do anything about sports. You're helpless. And what we have done is we've taken this incredible intelligence that every person has and we've channeled it into something that you can do nothing about. Chomsky says, politics is a little complicated, yeah, but not as complicated as the National Football League. <laughs> so politics you can do something about. But the idea is, let us take care of this. You can go watch the football game. So what we've done is taken this high degree of intelligence that adults have, and we've channeled it into this area. It's bread and circuses, in other words. So that's my answer to your question about my favorite sports. <laughs> Thank Next. you. Um, so my question about language is, what do you tell people or teachers or educators who say, I don't speak the primary language of the students? Oh, well, we don't need all teachers to be bilingual to do a bilingual program, obviously. I still don't see the connections. Anyway, uh, these, parts, these parts are done in English. You don't need both languages going from one teacher's mouth. In this traditional program, which is by now traditional, this is all in English, this is all in English, this is in the primary language. And this teacher can do the whole thing in the primary language. So you don't need to be bilingual to be a teacher in a bilingual program. Good evening. Uh, a question for you. Uh, with the adoption of the new 
ELA, ELD framework that has just been adopted this past July. In the ELD portion of it, that talks a lot about, you know, language acquisition with integrated and designated ELD. How do you see comprehensible input within that? My within answer to all programs from the governments are, are the kids getting compelling comprehensible input? Are they doing things in class that are going to expand their interests? Let me lay down another point. I'm just distorting your questions to say more <laughs> things I want to talk about. Okay. <clears throat> um, what we want in all of our programs is for our kids to find out who they are, what they're good at, what they like, and what they want to be when they grow up. And it's gradual over many years. Jewish philosophy says that. Your, your profession should be something you like, something you're good at, and something that helps people. What we want school to be is not to prepare students for specific skills, but to get a wide range of experience to discover your talents and interests. Should kids get the basics? Yes, but nowhere near what we think everybody should know. Uh, I'd say, yeah, learn how to read and write. It's a good idea. Uh, know something about the history of the world, science and math and all that, but not calculus for everybody and that kind of nonsense. We want kids not to get certain skills, because we don't know what tomorrow's skills are going to be anyway. Arne Duncan thinks he knows, but nobody knows. The scientific developments are always a surprise. A kid in fifth grade today, by the time they're in the workplace, the world is going to be totally different, and you cannot predict it. Yogi Berra said that. He said, it's hard to predict, especially about the future. <laughs> and this is absolutely true. So I'm giving you a general answer. What I want from any program is not an emphasis on specific skills, and that's not because I'm soft on crime. It's because I want kids to have a wide range so they can get excited about something and want to learn more about it. And this takes time. That's my answer to all those questions. Yeah, I've got two questions. The first one is, uh, you said that nobody is really interested in a language in a itself. A few people are, but crazy people like us, but very people are. Most people are. Okay, so if we want to teach a language, what are some good examples of what we can do with our students for okay. that reason? Okay, you've asked the core question of pedagogy. Congratulations. Extra credit. Good question. <laughs> if that's true, wise guy, what are we going to do in our classes? That's the question. <laughs> How do we get activities that are compelling and exciting for everybody? We're moving toward it. In beginning foreign language, I see the history of the last few decades as increasing toward more compelling input. The, it all started, let's say, in the 50s with grammar translation and audiolingual, which were boring as can be, not compelling at all. Then, stage forward, TPRS, TPR, James Asher, where you're doing activities in class. Stand up, sit down. Not too exciting, but much more exciting than that was. After that, my buddy Tracy Terrell and Natural Approach, where classroom became even more interesting, but it was still a traditional class. And it's still not the most compelling. The leader of the pack now is TPRS. How many of you have heard of this? OK, the rest of you, this is your assignment. Google TPRS. Blaine Ray, really interesting. I like it a lot. Uh, this, this lady in uh, New Delhi, she's a TPRS teacher, if you can check her out, TPRS. Uh, what it is is the classroom, the teacher and the students co-create interesting stories and interesting drama that is highly personalized, it's about the students and their lives, which is the most, most interesting way, the best way of making things compelling. One of my buddies, uh, he teaches high school Spanish, the whole curriculum, the first few weeks, is the students getting to know each other. They're quizzed on each other. Like, what are so-and-so's hobbies? What are his pets? What does he feed his pet guinea pig, et cetera? So the kids get to know each other. Then they can do these dramas in which where they're the main character. So is the problem solved at the beginning level? No, but it's much closer. And I'm hoping the genius of teachers is going to make more progress here. The intermediate level, we now teach content. And my nomination for content in intermediate language teaching is popular literature. And we've come closer to it, where kids are reading, say, comic books, magazines, discussing them as literature. 
let me give you a good source. A woman named Don Ellen Miller wrote a book called The Book Whisperer. How many of you have heard of this book? Am I right? Wow. Check out The Book Whisperer. She is a language arts teacher in Fort Worth. Teaches middle school, but what she's come up with, we can use. Let's say in language arts, you have to teach the genres. You know, it's part of the syllabus. And you have to do biography. Every student in the class has to read two biographies, but they choose the biography. Is that brilliant or what? She has found, so if someone wants to do Justin Bieber, they can do it in class. And the kids come in, 20 kids in the class, 40 different books they've read. You can imagine the quality of discussion. She says the minimum amount of reading is 40 books. Anyone who does 40 always does 55 because they get excited and they read more. So these are the ways language teaching is not already there at compelling. But we're kind of pushing in that direction. Next question. Yes, for those of us who would be interested in getting a PhD in a language, what would be some examples of some research ideas that we can do? Grasshopper, I cannot tell you that. The research idea must come from you. It has to be some, first of all, don't get a PhD unless you want to be a college professor and write boring, incomprehensible papers like I do. Okay, I think it's great, but this is not the life for most people. Uh, so, but if you're interested in that, fine. Uh, you need a topic that gets you out of bed in the morning, that you can't wait to turn on the computer and see what's in the next journal. And I can't tell you. It's got to come from you. Pollyannish answer, but true. <laughs> There's a question. Yes. Yes. Um, I, one of the kind of common sense arguments that I think bilingual, edu uh, bilingual education advocates have had, and I don't know if it's recently or for a long time, is that bilingual education is a must, because, and bilingualism is a must, so that you that our students can get jobs in the 21st global um, world. Mm -hmm. And so this comes off to me as a very marketized view of language and um, kind of economist, and I'm wondering if you... I think you're right. It's a marketing ploy, and it's not true. Very few jobs require bilingualism. Yes, if you want to, sell, if you want to buy, you can do it in English. If you want to sell, it's good to know your customer's language. Uh, and several people have become very good at languages because they've been in the business world. Steve Kaufman, who's an expert and has his website, he's a very interesting guy. He is great at about seven, eight languages because he's been a lumber salesman. And knowing all these languages has really helped him, and it's been great. But for most people, uh, no. And it's not even true of Chinese. So for, as a follow-up question, from a social justice perspective, do you see this as a big uh, kind of PR hoop? to overcome uh, kind of a problem with the bilingual education movement's um, message to the public? Tell me again what you mean. The, do you, this strikes, to, for me, this strikes me as a problem for social justice advocates who want to centralize that idea of language as a carrier of culture and, and not okay. just communication. Okay. It's true and it's not true in my opinion, and I'm speaking as an amateur, not as an expert and what my experiences have been. I don't do research in this area. Uh, yes, it is true that if you know the language of your culture, you will have much greater access to the wisdom. No question this is true. You'll be able to talk to your parents, grandparents, and aunts and uncles, and people in the home country and get insights you wouldn't get before. Is it necessary? No. Helpful? Yes. I'll give you my case. I have two heritage languages, Yiddish and Hebrew. Um, when I am in Israel, I try to speak, I speak Yiddish to the older generation, and they always want me to speak more Hebrew, so they're always correcting me. Then when I try to speak Hebrew to my cousins, they always answer in English. And if I go into a restaurant and I order in Hebrew, and I do have an accent in Hebrew, I'm not that good in Hebrew, I'm just kind of okay, uh, they always answer in English. This has not prevented me from being a student, not just of Israeli politics, but of Judaism in general. And yes, I can read the Old Testament in Hebrew and understand a lot of it, but the powerful insights I have gotten into philosophy and religion have come from reading in English 
in deep conversation with my rabbi in English, who is the best teacher I've ever met. So helpful, yes. Absolutely necessary, no. And I'm talking just as a private citizen, not as an expert. Chen, um, I heard you are a black belt in Taekwondo. I was wondering what is the role of a sport in bilingual education and vice versa, the role of bilingual education in sports? Good, good question, because I'm prepared to answer it. <laughs> questions, good questions are defined as those I've thought about. TPR. I would, I would love to in integrate creative movement into TPR instead of just stand up, raise your right hand. If John has a hat, pat your nose. I would like to teach cooking, lots of movement, dance, martial arts, and self-defense, all using the target language. That, to me, would be a great way of making things more compelling and interesting. So, and we have this idea. I've been thinking Krav Maga lessons, which is Israeli martial arts, Israeli fighting. And we were thinking of how to do it. And the Kali says, OK, we'll do it. You know, we'll say, here's fighting position. This is your right hand. Raise your right hand. No. The first lesson is, here's a gun in your face. What do you do now? <laughs> OK? And it's in the second language. OK? You don't, and if you teach people how to do it using the second language, you're going to get good fighting techniques. And you will absorb a huge amount of language. And the right vocabulary and grammar is going to be naturally recycled. So yeah, I think that's the application. I think we can use it, especially in beginning. Intermediate, you can introduce philosophy. When do you do it? When do you not? When is it appropriate? When is it not? Always a fascinating topic. Thanks for the question. Bigger. Um, my question has to do with uh, the Common Core. Um, First, I'm glad to hear that I won't get dementia until much later because I am bilingual. Yes. <laughs> I appreciate the thinking outside the box, too, and tying uh, in, in the activism and thinking of poverty, narrowing the poverty gap as opposed to teacher being the only variable in education. But um, for me, the, after having taught in, under NCLB for many years, uh, the Common Core are very compelling. and. Uh, under NCLB, you know, giving kids books was kind of a subversive activity. So I want to know what, how you would... Okay. Teachers in <clears throat> and large right now, I think, are welcoming the, change, the shift to Common Core simply because of the fact that it seems to be uh, less oppressive. If you look at carefully at the Common Core, especially the guidelines for publishers, written by David Coleman, who has never spent a day alone in a room with 10-year-old kids, who has never taught, written in cooperation with another friend who's a math professor and a lawyer. They wrote the standards. Here's what you see. Take independent reading. <clears throat> By the way, this is all in my article on this in the journal Language Arts, and you can find it in an English journal. You can find it on the website. Free voluntary reading is effectively banished. Because they say, yes, you can do self-selected reading, but it must be at the student's current reading level or above. And it must be combined with a pedagogical activity, such as vocabulary exercises. They have eliminated the possibility of kids finding out stuff for themselves and reading what they want to read. Not only that, because they have the interim examinations, the pressure on Preparing for the exams means you're going to have direct instruction. It's the only possibility. And the sequence of activities in language arts does not correspond to the developmental sequence, nor is it appropriately appropriate in terms of developmental psychology. Kids are being forced to do things that are too hard all over the place. So when you take a good look at what's actually there, here's the problem I see with Common Core. People look at it and because they haven't seen the whole thing, they find a part of it that is less disagreeable or that is better than what they were doing before. And they say, oh, therefore, it's OK. If you got rid of NCLB and you did what you wanted, you'd be much better off than the Common Core. Everything that's in the Common Core that's good, this tiny percentage, you can do right now anyway. 
So take a close look and see what's there. Hello, good evening. Um, I was wondering what your prediction is on the passing of SB 1174. Yeah, I think it'll go through, frankly. Uh, I think we've got a good chance. If we cooperate and push the McField research, I think it will go through. This to me, really, I think this is it. I think the crucial variable is getting their research out into the public so they know bilingual education actually works. Otherwise, we'll get these ignoramus letters like I read you from the Los Angeles Times. The crucial argument, bilingual programs, when they're set up right and evaluated correctly, produce good effects for English, significantly better than all English programs. That's going to be the one that's going to convince the public. So I think it's going to pass if that goes through. And the significant thing about 1174 is it's quite flexible. It doesn't say you've got to do this. It just opens the door. So I think we're going to get a lot of cooperation. I want David on television. That's really my goal. I think he's the one who's going to do it. <laughs> what, what do you expect from California if it does pass? Like, What are your expectations in the educational system? I think there'll be a gradual education about bilingual education. That's what I'm hoping. People will find out what it's all about, and they will be more eager to do it. When we first got 227, when it first hit, uh, I thought, fine, bring it on, as George Bush would say, okay? Uh, let's do it, because I thought this would be a, a place, finally, bilingual ed will be discussed in public, and there will be open debate about bilingual ed, and our side will get a chance to present the issues. Didn't happen. Did not happen. We never, pub we never penetrated the media. Now maybe we will. In, your, in terms of the poverty, um, I, you know, we're all, we're, some of us are here from an administration program for education, and I'm wondering, you know, we just had a talk at our staff meeting about poverty, and I'm sitting there with 130 staff members, and I'm wondering which of us that are staff members really understand poverty, so how do you teach, you know, teachers to understand kids that are coming to school with that, you know, with that in their mind. Yeah, so as an yeah. administrator, what, what can you tell us so that um, we can... I'll be happy to discuss this, but realize I'm talking to you person to person. I am not an expert on poverty. So we're just having our Starbucks discussion about it, and I have no special expertise. Well, people haven't lived through it, obviously, and people have not heard... Here, here's the thing about poverty that's crucial that I didn't bring up. The, the major misunderstanding the U.S. Department of Education has said we know all about poverty, but the way out of poverty is through education. Pump up education, and you will take care of poverty. So the Common Core, they think, they call it the civil rights argument of our times, because the kids will all be good, they'll all be able to do computer programming, calculus, they'll start all these new companies, and the economy will grow and prosper. Uh, Everyone who's studied this has found it's not true. In fact, the evidence goes the other way. Take care of poverty, and you improve education. Martin Luther King, 1967, we will find that the problems of education and poverty, I'm sorry, the problems of housing and education will themselves be solved when we take care of poverty. The answer to poverty is that people need money. People are poor because they don't have money. That is the biggest thing. There is no culture of poverty keeping them poor. They don't have jobs. Uh, for example, we know now that middle class people are now slipping into working class and are slipping into poverty all the time. They had values before them. They had values that allowed them to succeed in the middle class. They're not poor because they're lazy. They're poor because they don't have any income. That's the number one reason, in my opinion. The only answer, real answer to poverty, oh, by the way, the evidence for this is pretty strong. I gave you some of it. We know the impact of health, of lack of health care. We know the impact of lack of books. We know all the, uh, the separate aspects of poverty are devastating to educational achievement. We also know that there's no correlation between high test scores of a country and its gross economic product, et cetera. They're not correlated. They have nothing to do with each other. So the real answer. I think, and I'm going to attack my own position now, is full employment at a living wage for people who do an honest day's work 
They need to get reasonable pay they can live from. That was Martin Luther King's idea. What I have recommended is a Band-Aid, taking all that money that we're putting into testing, or at least even part of it, and using it for better food programs, using it for better health care, and to pump up the libraries. That's a Band-Aid. The real problem is full employment, and that is a purely economic problem that really only the government can solve. My question has to do with um, the culture, you might call it, that our politicians have and have had for many, many years, decades, centuries maybe, this idea that monolingualism is the only option for America. Not just that immigrants um, must speak English and only English, but that people who speak English at home um, as their native language cannot possibly learn a second language because it's just too hard for the human brain to actually be able to speak two languages. I think that that view is reflected in the ignoramuses comment mm -hmm. in the LA Times that you know mm -hmm. you can't possibly you know if you're if you're speaking your native language your L1 it must be squeezing out your ability to learn an L2 and I, so I think the problem is you know, not only do we have a problem with teaching immigrants to speak, um, convincing politicians that immigrants can learn to speak English very, very well while still maintaining their native language, but also we have, a, I think, a crisis in second language teaching for native English speakers. I think, you know, we do a par very poor job in this country of teaching people a second language in K through 12 education. So I guess my question for you is, um, how do we overcome that political hurdle of, uh, of, of trying to convince policymakers that people can actually learn to speak more than one language well, putting that message out there that's actually good for your brain and good for learning to speak more than one language? Yeah, I wish I were more of an expert in the dissemination of ideas, because uh, that's basically what I've been trying to do the last 35 years is say that the comprehension, not that the comprehension hypothesis is right, but that it's a viable alternative. For most people, and I'm restating your point, the skill building hypothesis is not a hypothesis, it's an axiom. And I'm trying at least to demote it to the status of hypothesis. And I'm doing my best. I'm, you know, sending things out all the time. And I need your help to read Susan Elhanian and pass it on. <laughs> person by person, you know. That's the way it's, the problem is one of information. In terms of language, what's interesting is that there's no evil plot. There's nobody holding us back. Nobody profits from not believing in comprehension. So I think it should be easy to do once we get the ideas around. The textbook companies can still make money. Just have better books. When um, some uneducated parents of my English-speaking students complain about um, students speaking other languages in class, I try to pull something that I heard once in a lecture about um, how maybe it was IQ was measured, and there was a statistic that I wish I could recall, and m maybe you know it, about uh, people who can speak two languages or more languages, um, their IQ is higher. And I, I don't, I, it seems to me that I heard something like that, yeah. and I want to be able to articulate it Since correctly I'm an expert, I can tell you all about it. Perfect, thank you. Um, <clears throat> the research kind of supports it. If you look at Jim Cummins' papers, he has nice summaries, where bilinguals, if you compare bilinguals and people with similar backgrounds or monolinguals, <clears throat> Bilinguals do better on some tests, as we talked about, like paying attention, not getting distracted, and other kinds of tests as well. And they do slightly better in school. So there is a tendency for bilinguals to do better on a number of tests that are vaguely related to intelligence. It's not true of everybody. I personally know several counterexamples. Okay. I like Cummins' conclusion. We know bilingualism is not bad for the brain, and it's probably good.
Oh, the TPRS. <clears throat> if I, for beginning, find out about TPRS. Find out. It's the one that's happening now and the most interesting, and I'll tell you why it's a lot of fun. If you go to a TPRS conference, and they're all over the place, people giving workshops and all that, at the big national conferences, you go to these conferences and you can take another language in a nine hour short course. It is so much fun for crazy people like us who love languages. And you get all the interaction, all the dynamics, and you see how it's done. So I think TPRS includes the best of all these other methods. I would find out about it. The guy who invented it is a high school, former high school Spanish teacher, Blaine Ray. But there are groups throughout the country. It's a good example, I think, of ethical capitalism all right, and proper entrepreneurship. The high school teachers in various areas of the country have formed their own little companies. Blaine Ray has his. Karen Rowan has hers in Colorado. Carol Gobb has hers in, in Arizona. And they give their own conferences. They create their own materials. And it's sold at very low price to get them around just to keep the companies going. They've started writing books in the languages, little readers like, like graded readers in English. A lot of my Spanish comes from reading their graded readers, as a matter of fact. Uh, and they don't compete because they're in different areas of the country. They cooperate. So I would find one of these seminars to go to. You can get stuff online. Just type in TPRS in Google and you'll find it. It will work with little kids. It'll work with everybody. That's why I like it. We are instituting it now with the Turkish military. And these are big, tough guys. OK. OK. OK, I got to go home. Come on. One more question. You've been so patient. One more. I'd like to refer back to the chart that you put there on the second row. Yeah. Uh, music. music. That's a trouble clef, in so, my opinion, yes. Being, being, a, being a big believer in connecting with the schema of the child before you can teach them something, if you look on the, on the far uh, right of that second row, the core, they don't have English, is, they don't have a schema in that. They have no schema in that. Okay, but you go over to art and PE and music, they will have some schema. Yes, they will. That makes it more comprehensible. Right. So therefore, they can grab onto some of the English there. While exactly. Still getting, still getting the core. Exactly. And then, so, then they're going to get all that conversational English, and then you slowly slip them down the chart uh, as they get more schema in English. So, see, I had this in the first language. What yeah. you're suggesting is that doing these is going to include a lot of this. It's going to include a lot more complicated things than just learning a few songs and drawing pictures. It's going to help them to, I think you're right. to establish the establish base in L2. Um, and, and then they can move that core down so they're getting more and more in L2. Let me share with you my fantasy life. <laughs> my fantasy is start out, say, in English for this, say, music part. Give all the kids a recorder or a ukulele right away. Ukulele, you know, five chords, you're off and running. Not only do you teach them songs and teach them how to play stuff and sing, but as they get older, you include musicology, otherwise known as gossip about composers, starting with, of course, the greatest composers ever, the Beatles. There's so many stories about the Beatles that are so juicy that tell you so much about life, the world, culture. Then eventually, if they get older, you tell them about Ravel and Gershwin hanging out together and being buddies and going up and hearing tell jazz. Stories. stories. You got it. Thank you. So I think this is a great way of teaching sociology, history, psychology, all this. That's the way.